Well, good evening, my friends, and welcome to another Bible study on the nines this Thursday evening. And I hope and trust you've had a great week so far. We are looking through our series on Thursday evenings on this online Bible study, 39 Keys, the 39 Books, Unlocking the Old Testament. And tonight we come to the last book of the historical books of the Old Testament, and that is the book of Esther and the key verse of a fantastic story in the Bible, the book of Esther, the key verse of Esther. The events of the book of Esther, it takes place in Persia between 483 to 473 BC. The book fits into the 58 years between Ezra 6 and Ezra 7. So between the first and second return, if, if you wanna read it in chronological order, go to read Ezra 1 through 6, then go to Esther, then go back to Ezra 7 through 10. The theme of the book of Esther is that God uses ordinary men and women to overcome seemingly impossible circumstances to accomplish his purposes. The purpose is to encourage the Jews with the great way God delivered the Jewish people during the reign of King Xerxes or Ahasuerus and to remind them of the faithfulness of God who would keep his promises to them. The key word there in the book of Esther is the word providence. When I looked at the book of Esther, God's name is not mentioned, but you see his providence working through the scenes, bringing about a deliverance for the people of God. The key characters in the book of Esther, you find, of course, Esther, a beautiful Jewish orphan girl named Hadassah, who becomes queen of Persia. You see Mordecai, Esther's cousin, who adopted her and raised her as a daughter, you have King Xerxes, which is Greek for uh, Ahasuerus, the king of Persia from 46 to 464 BC. And you see Haman, wicked Haman, a high ranking Persian official uh, who had a deep prejudice animosity toward the Jews. Two sections in the book of Esther and Esther's in these two, in these 10 chapters, you see part one, you see the threat to the Jews from chapters one through four, and you see the triumph of the Jews in chapter five through 10 incredible book of the Bible, surrounds the, the festival of Purim. And I was in Israel years ago during that festival. It's a, it's a huge celebration for the Jews because uh, it, it was Esther delivering her people from annihilation by the Persians. And what an incredible story, incredible, uh, courageous story and how God works through situations. But I begin tonight with a question. As we look here in Esther chapter four, and verse 14, here's the key verse of all of Esther. Mordecai, I was talking to Esther, and it's quoted. I've seen him on pictures on walls, but notice this. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And we've always heard such a time as this. That's, that's the key. Mordecai's challenge to Esther to deliver her people. God had placed her in that spot to deliver her people. So here's the question. What obstacle are you facing in your life today? What problem has presented itself? What circumstance are you in that's out of your control where you don't know how you're gonna get the strength to face it? I think about our national problems right now and the circumstances we've all been facing in this season of time in our history. Uh, we've all experienced many obstacles due to the lasting, the, the pandemic of last year and the lasting effects of it now. I've heard that we're all in the same storm, just in different boats. And these individual boats that we're riding in carry with it many problems, much uncertainty. But what obstacle that are you facing in your life today? On a personal level, it could be obstacles in your marriage, in your family, fear of your kids, maybe uh, furloughed or, or laid off from your job or Uncertainty for the future or, or a health scare or it could be a circumstances out of your control, unrelated. It could be obstacles based upon past circumstances out of our control. We all know and understand in the midst of these obstacles, we still have to live life. And in order to live life, decisions are required each and every day. I once read in a book that uh, the average person makes 70 conscious decisions a day. Think about that. If we make 70 conscious decisions a day, that's 25,550 decisions a year, and that's 1,788,500 decisions over a course of 70 years. 
We make the decisions and the decisions we make make us. Add up all these decisions over the course of time, good or bad, and what you get is a life. We go through doors, we make decisions, and on the other side of those doors, we find the person that we become. Life is full of decisions, and they get harder as you get older because of obstacles and because of circumstances. Hey, many times the decision isn't black and white due to obstacle and circumstances of the day. Sometimes it's because you've got limited information and you can only make the decision based upon the information that you're presented with. Just living life and making decisions come with anxiety and worry because every choice in life comes with a consequence. What if I make the wrong decision? What if I can't navigate the obstacle in my path? What if I can't solve the problem in my life? But we cannot live on what ifs to this tonight. We can't dwell on the what ifs. That's why we need wisdom. That's why we need prayer. And that's why we need faith. Hey, you know, faith connects us to God. Faith seeks to surrender to God's kingdom purposes. And, and faith is dependent upon God. As the Bible says, the just shall live by faith. And this can only come from God. And when we read his word and apply his word and we seek him in prayer, when we develop and cultivate our relationship with Christ, our mind is renewed, our focus turns upward, and we remember that as believers in Christ, we are called for a purpose. We desire to glorify God and, and enjoy him. We know and understand that in whatever circle of influence we may be in, or whatever season we are in, we are called as believers to do our part to portray Christ to others for such a time as this. With this in mind, let's consider this text, this key verse, and that of a queen in Persia who faced some major obstacles in her life due to circumstances out of her control. So in chapter 4, Queen Esther from the palace is communicating with Mordecai through a servant named Hatach. Life circumstance out of her control was this. Nobody at this point knew that Esther was the Jewish girl named Hadassah. She had been instructed to keep her identity a secret back when she had been taken along with all the other young girls in the empire to beautify, spend one night with the king, and the, and the one which he would choose would become queen. God worked through this horrible negative circumstance to promote Esther to queen of all Persia. She had obtained favor in the sight of the king, a very beautiful woman. At this point, she had been queen about five years. Here's the first obstacle. She finds out a day is coming when all of Esther's people, the Jews within the borders of the Persian Empire, would be annihilated. This had been devised by wicked Haman, who hated the Jewish people, who deceived the king of Persia to write this law. This law cannot be repealed or changed. It was set in stone. The city was in confusion. Chapter 3, verse 13 through 15. The second obstacle she had not been summoned to the king for 30 days. And if you approach the king without being summoned and he doesn't extend the golden scepter out to you, the law was that you'd be put to death. Even if the queen approached him without being summoned. So we see that Esther, queen of all Persia, faced with the possibility of her people being exterminated. And she felt she couldn't do anything about it because of the protocol approaching the king. Yet she, she is urged by Mordecai, you must go to the king. You must do your part to save our people. Let's put this in modern day terminology. Sometimes we are where we are in life due to a circumstance out of our control. We have plans. God has his. He opens doors. He shuts them. And he takes us and he puts us where we are in this moment many times out of our control. We work hard. Doors open. Doors shut. God leads where in this moment decisions are made based upon the circumstances of our life, then there is obstacles, a nation in chaos, a pandemic, personal storms out of our control, obstacles or ways in which we feel like we can't do what we're called to do. The big question was, how would Queen Esther respond to this circumstance and this crisis? For us in those moments, we are faced with a response. We are faced with a decision point. The question that is posed to us by this text what is your decision when circumstances happen and obstacles occur? There are two decisions that, are, that confronted Esther, and these same decisions confront us whenever circumstances happen and obstacles occur. There's the selfish decision, 
And there's the kingdom decision. So let's look, first of all, at the selfish decision. Look at verse 11 through 14. All the king's servants and the people of the, of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but what, one law put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words, and Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you may remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I see in verse 11 and 12, the selfish decision is, where Esther could have, she could have stayed silent, lived in the palace and just checked out. And we do this a lot of times when God puts us in this place and the circumstances happen and we just stay silent and check out in life. Why do we do this? Verse 11 and 12 tells us because the obstacle, whatever that obstacle is, it freezes us in fear. Esther's fear. She knew that if she tried to enter the king's presence uninvited, she would be risking her life. And would she be willing to risk her life on behalf of her people? For us, when obstacles and circumstances happen out of our control, when we're called to do something for the Lord, our initial response is fear. We fill in over our head. Fear of the unknown. Fear of the circumstances themselves. Fear of other people. Fear of death. Fear of uncertainty. Even Mordecai reaffirms to Esther in verse 13 that there's no guarantees in life. The fear paralyzes us and we stay silent and we just check out. This leads to excuses. I can't or what if. But are we focused more on the obstacle or the opportunity in the midst of the obstacle? The fear isn't wrong. We're all afraid. It's the response and reaction to that fear which shows that the fear controls us or not. I see also that the obstacle inconveniences our comfort zone. Verse 13 and 14, we've just read it. The, we all have a comfort zone. We've got to overcome that comfort zone when circumstances and obstacles come up and a decision is required. I personally believe that everyone who has trusted Christ as their Savior has a mission and a purpose in which God has called us and equipped us with spiritual gifts. The purpose is to make a difference in the body of Christ for the cause of Christ. Sometimes that mission changes in every decade of our lives. Sometimes that mission defines what we are born to do in this world. If we do not pursue that mission, we will find a substitute. It's called the shadow mission. It's what we will do if our lives drip back into autopilot we check out. It consists of those activities that we will move toward or where our natural temptations and selfishness take over. It consists of the excuses that we give for not doing all we can for the Lord. Sometimes the comfort zones are inconvenienced. Everybody has a shadow mission. It's shaped by our culture, our comfort zones, and the desire for personal peace. And I don't want to be bothered and influenced. I just want more and more material things. We are not told in Scripture what Esther's dreams for her life had been. We do know she was drafted against her will to be a part of a royal harem. As Xerxes searched for a queen, her life was interrupted. And when Esther became queen, her value to the king was her face and her body. Safety, security, fame, and attractiveness, was this becoming her shadow mission? Was this becoming her comfort zone? Yet God had other plans for her if she would embrace it. God's plan for a redemptive community was placed in the hands of a beautiful queen named Esther. In verse 13, she may have thought, if I just stay silent, it won't happen to me or my family because I'm in the palace. I see in her heart a battle going on. An inconvenience comfort zone. She is Hadassah, a Jew who loves her people and wants to do right. And then she's Queen Esther of Persia who came to the king only when summoned. Whenever we're confronted with the gospel, whenever we are confronted with our sin, whenever we are confronted with stepping out in faith and going to the extra mile for the sake of the call of our Lord Jesus Christ, and whenever we are confronted and convicted to go to extra mile to better ourselves and grow in Christ, do we fail to respond because it affects our comfort zone? And when the things of the Lord inconveniences us because there's something in our lives that's wrong and we need to change, 
and we don't, we've given into that comfort zone mentality. When the excuses become prevalent in our lives, we will remain in those comfort zones. And when this happens, we live in our shadow mission. We reason, if I serve the Lord in his capacity, it's going to cost me this, it's going to cost me this. And then add to it the circumstances and obstacles of our day. Have we given into our comfort zones? Another thing I see about the obstacle with the selfish decision is that the obstacle causes us to forget God. Think about Mordecai's response in verse 13 and 14. You're going to be found out if you remain silent. Relief and deliverance will come for the Jews from another place and, and you and your father's house will perish. Hey, Mordecai, I knew God's word. He knew God's character. And Mordecai, I knew that God will not permit his entire people to be wiped out because of that covenant in Abraham. Remember God's promise to Abraham, our key verse there in Genesis chapter 12. Had Esther forgotten about God's promise? Had Esther forgotten about she had been placed there by the goodness and sovereignty of God? Do we, in the midst of our overwhelming circumstances and obstacles, forget about God's plan, God's kingdom, God's purpose, and even God's providence? Hey, understand something tonight. We are what we are by the grace of God. Extraordinary experiences and opportunities we are granted are not merely for our sake, but for the sake of God's agenda, that of the gospel, and that of the kingdom. And when we lose sight of that, my friend, we miss God's kingdom's purpose in history, and we miss the opportunity. If Esther had refused to use her position for kingdom influence, God would still have gotten a job done by some other means, even though Esther and her father's house would be destroyed. Remember, God is going to accomplish his program with or without us. That's in scripture. He certainly desires to use each and every one of us. And if you disobey, he will carry out his agenda through somebody else and you have just missed an opportunity to serve his kingdom purposes. So Mordecai follows up in that key verse. Who knows whether you are, uh, have not attained royalty who have come to this position for such a time as this. Don't you see, Esther, that God has placed you in this situation at this time in history that you can have a tremendous kingdom impact? That's the selfish decision. But then we see in verse 15 through 16, Esther was reminded that God had placed her where she was for such a time as this, and she made the kingdom decision in order to deliver her people from the de de destruction and in effect be used of God for his kingdom purposes. The nation would bring forth Messiah, Jesus Christ. When Mordecai I reminded Esther of this thought, it helped her make the right decision. Look at verse 15. Then Esther told them the reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. We see here where the obstacle drives us to prayer. Esther asked Mordecai to assemble all the Jews in the city and fast and pray for three days. And she would do the same. Even though God's name is not mentioned in this text, his providence is evident and we can see the act of humiliation before him in prayer. No doubt this was accompanied by prayer because throughout scripture, fasting and prayer are found together. Mordecai united the Jews in Susa to pray for Esther as she prepared to approach the king. This was a matter of life and death for both her and her people. And God used the crisis that Haman had created to bring a spiritual revival in his people scattered throughout the Persian Empire. It is often the case that God's people have to experience trouble before they will humble themselves and cry out to God. In our lives, think about the circumstance that God has brought you to where you are. Think of the circumstance, think of the obstacles currently in your way. Are you praying? Are you completely dependent upon the Lord? Are you praying for your friends and family? Are you praying for our nation and all the problems facing our nation right now? Are you praying for our church and for God's will? For obstacles bring out opportunity for kingdom advancement. We must spend time praying without ceasing, humbling ourselves before the Lord, dependent upon him. Hey, this obstacle not only brings, out, it brings us the prayer, but it brings out our courage. Esther says, I will go to the king in verse 15 and 16. I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. 
I wonder if Esther reviewed her life based upon Mordecai's words. I can guarantee you, if she did this, she would have seen that when she reviewed her life, she couldn't help but see that there had been a divine leading all the way. Now, if God had brought her to the throne, then God had a purpose in mind, and that purpose was now evident. She was there to intercede for her people. The fate of a whole nation, the fate of the people of God was in the hands of Esther, and she was reassured of that fact. Where she was in that moment was no accident. Circumstances had worked out in order that she had come to the position of queen for such a time as this. She just needed courage to act on behalf of her people. Courage, my friend, is the ability to confront something painful or difficult or dangerous despite any fear. It's a choice. For the, the courageous person feels the fear, feels the pain, feels the danger, but you persevere anyway. It's motivated by the cause. It's worth standing up for and fighting for despite all the clear reasons not to. And in that moment, Esther made a kingdom decision in spite of the fear and obvious reasons not to. It amounted to a courageous decision. In our lives, are we courageous in the face of circumstances? I see another thing. The obstacle causes us to surrender it to the Lord. After three days of fasting and prayer, she agreed to go to the king and she surrendered the mission wherewith God had placed her within the saying when she says, if I perish, I perish. How should we interpret those words? If I perish, I perish. Do these words suggest unbelieving resignation or trusting submission to the will of God? I do the Lord's will, whatever the cost. I believe this submission to the will of God because her words echo the words of the Apostle Paul in Acts 20, 24, when he says, None of these things move me, neither count I my life dear to myself, that I may finish my course of joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. From a human point of view, everything was against Esther in the success of her mission. The law was against her because nobody was allowed to interrupt the king. The government was against her for the decree said she had to be slain. Her sex was against her because the king's attitude toward women was worse than chauvinistic. Even the fast was against her because she, she went three days without food or drink. That would not necessarily improve her appearance or physical strength. But Romans 8.31, if God be for us, who can be against us? Let me ask, answer that question, nobody. In our lives, after we pray, after we decide to act courageously, when we surrender all to the Lord, we allow him to work, not knowing the outcome, not having guarantees, and he will work. Tonight, we've seen a contrast between two decisions in this key verse of Esther. The selfish decision and the kingdom decision in the face of obstacles and circumstances in our lives. Our application and takeaway answers this question. What is the difference between the selfish decision and the kingdom decision? And here's, here's the application. Where is your focus and who is at the center of your life, Christ or self? For Esther, the circumstances and obstacles revealed that it was her time. She was the solution. She had to take a risk of faith. She had to step up for her people. It was a fearful situation that she had walked in. It looked like she was choosing to die, but she was in essence choosing to live the life that God had called her to live. And that's a paradox. If she had not had Mordecai, perhaps she would have never had understood her mission. Without his challenge, she may never have embraced it and no one could achieve her mission for her. She had to do it alone. For you and for me, your circumstances and your obstacles reveal that it is your time. You are called for such a time as this. It could be the Holy Spirit is convicting you about your salvation. If you have trusted Christ, remember in Christ, God has saved you. He's called you. He's equipped you with spiritual gifts. He's placed you in the job he has, in the area he has placed you, with the people he has given you. You may have been placed there where you are to help somebody or win somebody to Christ that nobody else could. There is an opportunity for the kingdom of God in every aspect. Many times are disguised as obstacles. In the midst of those obstacles, a decision is required. Hey, you can be paralyzed by your circumstances or you can choose to live the life that God has called you to. There's a risk, but this is your time. 
not some other situation, not tomorrow, not yesterday. You are where you are and who you are for a reason, to be salt in a savory world, to be a light in a dark world. Hey, who is your Mordecai? Who knows you well enough to identify what God is calling you to do? Who loves you enough to challenge you when you want to shrink back? The church is called to accomplish kingdom purposes. If a local church is not striving to win the lost to Christ and disciple them in the faith so they can have a heavenly influence on earth, the church has failed in its calling. The church, we here at Bethlehem Baptist, we have been called to God's kingdom for such a time as this. Whose agenda will you follow? It all depends on where your focus is and who is at the center of your life. Remember, the result of not being whom God wants you to be will lead to frustration. To tie this all together, in conclusion, my son Liam is three years old, and uh, last summer I was at the beach with my family, and I was teaching, at that time my son was two years old, and I was teaching my son how to float in the pool and not be afraid of the unknown. I, as his father, equipped my son with floats on his chest and his arms. I told my son, I said, Liam, don't be afraid. I'm with you. I placed my son at the stairs of the pool where he got his feet wet. And it was up to my son, Liam, to make the decision. I could not make that decision for him. I jump into the, I'm standing right here. For him, that was deep water. For me, it was three foot. I'm six foot four, so it's really nothing for me. But to jump into my arms or stay scared with your feet wet there at the stairs. I said, come on, jump out to me, Liam. And thankfully he jumped and I caught him and he kicked his feet up and I assured I had him. And the look on my son's face was the best definition of contentment I've ever have seen or read. And he just, the look on my son's face as I was holding my son and he was in the deep with me, he was even humming, enjoying time with me. In like manner, if you know Christ, you've been equipped. He's told us he'd be with us. And all we need to do is see him in the midst of our circumstances and our obstacles of the, of the deep water. Will we see that we are where we are for such a time as this and jump into the deep? Or will we settle to keep our feet wet, frozen in fear? What risk of faith is God calling you to make? Are you willing to obey God's word even when the outcome is uncertain? Even if it might cost you, don't let the time you've been given and the opportunities that are at your disposal pass you by. You are here for such a time as this. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are, know that God has called you to be to this place, wherever you're at, for such a time as this. Great thought from this key verse in Esther. That, that ends our Bible study for tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope and trust you have a great rest of the week. Looking forward to our services here at Bethlehem Baptist this Sunday. 9.30 a.m. Sunday school, 10.30 a.m. worship. If you're in the area, I'd love for you to come and, and worship with us if you don't have a church home. And uh, we'd love to have you. Anyway, I'm going to sign off. You guys have a good evening. God bless you. Have a good night.